You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. This is the Center Steer Podcast, the first Land Rover podcast on the planet. Center Steer is a podcast by, for, and about Land Rover owners. Welcome to show number 68 for November 2018. I'm your host, John Costage, near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and joining me via Skype is Harold. How are you doing, Harold? I'm here. Welcome. Glad you're here. I'm not sure where Mike and Morgan are. They've had some uh, personal issues to deal with and could not join us May have to send out a search party, especially for Morgan. We have Morgan. If you're listening, I haven't heard from you in like a month, man. Hope you're okay. Yeah, send up a flare, dude. Our guest this month is Kathy Eldon. Kathy is the mother of Dan Eldon. Dan was a British Kenyan photojournalist, artist, and activist. He was killed in Somalia while working at a Reuter, as a Reuters photojournalist. And a film was made about his life called The Journey is the Destination back in 2016. It is available on Netflix. Uh, that's where I watched it. Uh, it's an inspiring story in a number of ways. And for us, we were very interested in Dan's Land Rovers. So we're going to talk to Kathy later. Well, of course. You know, first yeah. things first, right? <laughs> exactly. He, had, he has two of them. Kathy now has, what, f- four? Was that is that the right number? Oh, actually, no. Kathy has two and Dan had two. So there's four total. In yeah, I think it's four total. Yeah, she had she had two. I wonder how they're faring in, in the, the fires out there because she wasn't too far from that, that fire in Southern California. Yeah, because we, we recorded her interview before the fire broke out, I think. Uh, and... Long before. I'm looking at the numbers here. There was Desiree. There was, a, oh, a Land Cruiser, which was... Uh... Well, we don't talk about that. <laughs> There's Big Blue. There was uh, Desiree L.A. And then there was Arab... Ar- was it Arabasia? Arabashka? L.A.? Stay with us, and you can listen to Kathy. And... Yeah, don't give up halfway. you got to listen to the whole freaking episode, dude. A very special thank you to our Patreon patrons. Your support really does help us, especially with our uh, domain management and website hosting, and also now t-shirt production. Visit patreon.com slash center steer for all the details and to become a Patreon patron yourself. Our current supporters are going to receive a free podcast t-shirt. I've already contacted them. They've gotten back to me, and I'll be sending those shirts out And I want to thank you for your comments, follows, likes on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and email. One in particular that we got this month. Uh, Thanks to Morgan. Uh, We have two new listeners, Jan and Wit. Although, to be sure, Jan is really the listener. Wit is the truck. But let me read you what Jan said. Thanks for leaving a center steer card on my windscreen last Saturday. I can see I have a lot of podcasts to download. (laughs) Witt didn't have a name when I bought him 30 years ago. I named him after a friend who was also a 1967 edition. Uh, Witt just got a paint job and a new canvas for his birthday. Took me a year to save up for that rather spendy present, but it's worth it. He's been my daily driver for most of our 30 years together, and I figured I've got another 30 years realistically before he'll need a new owner. Yeah, make sure you don't sell that truck, because then we'll have to call you witless. <laughs> I hadn't even thought of that. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So we know at least Morgan was, was active in somewhere about a month month and a half ago. Because this listener is in Vermont? Is that how we know it was Morgan? Uh, I believe he's in that way. He said because uh, a card was placed on his truck. Yeah, it has a Vermont license. Okay. All right. Yeah, then then that's Morgan. Because, you know, if it's a listener from from... Pennsylvania it might not be Morgan to blame. Yeah, it's a very nice short uh, wheelbase Series 2A wing. The rearview mirrors are on the wings. Okay. So, and a uh, canvas top it looks like a pickup at the moment. At least the picture he sent me in front cool. of it in front of a dam. Uh, so it looks nice. So thanks very much, Jan or maybe Jan for messaging us. As I said earlier, we now have podcast T-shirts available for sale. So if all goes as planned. The online shop will be up and running by the time the podcast is posted. If it's not, that means I had to focus on getting the podcast produced. Uh, But there is one design in one color in a range of sizes available from small to 3XL available. But you can have it in any color you want as long as it's brown. Uh, The cost is $20 American. And to help cover shipping costs, if you buy two shirts or more, shipping is free. Otherwise, it'll be $5 to ship them in the continental United States. So it's like twenty five bucks for one shirt or forty for two. Ah, uh, correct. That okay. is that. that That's is, kind of a good deal if you want to get two, especially for the upcoming holiday season. 
Well, or, or you know, one to wear out when you're with friends and another one to get dirty when you're working on your truck. Exactly. And they're and since they're brown, they're already muddy and dirty. They are the color of mud. Uh, if you are outside of the U.S. Uh, ship and shipping's over ten dollars, I might ask you to help out with some of the shipping costs. I know we have a lot of listeners, mainly in the U.S., but we also have listeners in the U.K., Canada, Norway, Australia. So just ask you to maybe work with us a little bit on that. I'll try to, you know. We're we're making a little bit of money on the on the shirts, but I would hope to eventually like to redu- at least recoup the costs of the shirt. Yeah, we're not looking to retire on t-shirt sales, that's for sure. Uh, or, or, or the podcast at all, no. Uh, no. <laughs> that would be, nice. be a very bad plan. <laughs> it would be. It'd be nice if someone to roll in and you know drop a couple hundred thousand dollars a year on us, and we could do a wonderful podcast all the time. Or the same shit for for hey, just hey, way too much money. You're, you're not selling us, Harold. You need to upsell, Harold. Upsell. Uh, stickers will also be available for $2 American. Uh, it, now, in Pennsylvania, clothing is not taxed, so I, there will be no tax added on for Pennsylvania residents. But we will include the tax in the sticker costs if you're there. Yeah, if you're a PA resident, we'll take care of that. We just, we'll, yeah, on we'll, a $2 sticker, we can afford to eat the tax on that. Yeah, and the shipping. I mean, I, I think the stickers cost like 65, 68 cents a piece to make. So, you know, another 50 cents to ship it for one. Right. And then tax. But, you know, we're you know, not making a lot, I, I admit. And I'll probably, and even if. No, you, but we're, we're, we're covering costs. That's fine. Yeah, trying to, trying to. And if you get two shirts, probably, I'll probably throw in a free sticker too, just because. Of course, for the price of fuel and time, we'll hand deliver it. Indeed, if, if that's what you want, but you're, that's coming out of your pocket. Coming out of your, that's special delivery by a 1987 Defender 110. Harold and I will personally deliver, hand deliver, a shirt and or a sticker or both for for for, for costs which will be negotiated <laughs> exactly. at purchase. <laughs> All right, let's move into the news, shall we? Uh, All right. As yes, although you know, nice, jovial, and fun, Land Rover did not unfortunately have a good uh, month in the last uh, in, back in October. JLR uh, lost a uh, slid about thirteen percent in sales. Uh, they've fallen sharply. So the firm blamed a lower sales in China for the decline, as well as in. Uh, uncertainty in Europe over diesel and Brexit. I know you've heard us all before, but it's that's like important. four or five months in a row that they've they've lost sales, isn't it? Uh, I think this is now, but it's always been variable. Like where this time it, uh, I think the like you know the U.S. was down once, I think then back up, and then Europe was down, down, and then kind of started back up, and then China would be up, but then now China's okay. down. If I remember correctly, I know I could be wrong, but my understanding is it seems like it keeps changing. One of the articles I read actually mentioning about China, you may recall the China was lower people were waiting to buy in china because they were going to lower the import duty from what was it 25 to 15 percent yeah waiting for the tariff to go down everybody's going to wait and not buy anything which makes perfect sense to me it does except that sales did not rebound after that happened so i think Hmm. so that seems to be why they're now blaming china was that sales haven't rebounded and they're not sure why uh i think one of the articles here i think i might find that detail uh jlr uh people found other things to spend their money on while they were waiting uh, maybe like Mercedes and BMW, I or think. Or something, yeah. So JLR made a pre-tax loss of 90,000, 90 million pounds for the quarter compared to the profit, to a profit from the same time uh, last year. Uh, JLR said as a result, it was launching a far-reaching cost-cutting program. We'll talk about that more in a moment. And JLR said the 2.5 billion pound turnaround program would include reducing investment, taking out inventory, and working capital. Uh, the new strategy will lay the foundation for sustainable growth and profitable growth. And we'll, we'll t- Ralph uh, Spath will tell us more about that in a moment. Uh, the firm's Sully Hall plant, where it makes Range Rover Jaguar models, is closed for a two week sh- uh, shutdown in response to fluctuating demand. Now, this article is from the end of uh, October, so that it's back open back up again, but it's just good to remind people that that occurred. Now, this mm-hmm. is an analysis from the BBC business correspondent. 
uh, that uh, it has been hit by a series of problems. Many of its models have diesel engines and have therefore been affected by recent environmental worries, and it has seen as having been too slow to adapt to demands for new hybrid and electric versions. The North American market is slowing down, but it is in China that it has had its biggest problems. JLR said sales there have been hit by consumer uncertainty following import duty changes and escalating trade tensions with the U.S., but other luxury car brands are increasing sales there, so it's not clear why JLR is suffering so badly. Hmm. Okay. So there's that. Yeah, there's that moment. I wasn't sure exactly where it was. That for some reason, just uh, in in the uh, China, they're having some problems. So as we just mentioned, JLR is going to have a turnaround plan, and in U.S. dollars, it's three point two billion dollars. That's a lot of money. That's a that's a that's a super lot of money. Uh, here's some details. That's, that's a lot of money to spend on saving money. Well, I think that I don't think they're spending 3.2. I think that's the savings part. I think that's oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I think I, it's I misunderstood. I yeah, it's not clear. I think that's like some savings. I think they're spent. They're certainly spending money, but I think that's the savings. I well, let's read some details here. It is called okay. Project Change. And it's plans to cut costs and improve cash flow by $3.2 billion or 2.5 billion pounds over 18 months. Uh, JLR also plans to launch several new vehicles, including the I-PACE and the new Defender over the next few years, and will offer a, a hybrid or full electric version of all its models by 2020. And if I can pause the podcast, if so to speak, for here... Autoblog, get your story straight. You called it the Range Rover Defender. I just had uh, to call that out. Uh, yeah, that's why I stumbled. I mean, Autoblog, of all people, they, they they know better. I'm not sure we need to pause the podcast for that. They need to be publicly shamed for that. <laughs> well, we are. We're publicly shaming them. Uh, although it looks like they may have copy and pasted a, a Reuters article. I could reach through the internet and bitch slap them, I would. <laughs> Continuing on, as part of the turnaround plan, JLR will first focus on cash-saving quick wins, like reducing non-product investments, reducing non-product investments, and speeding up asset sales, Tata said. So that non-product investment, I suspect, is one of the re- is probably where Savannah. The, the Savannah yeah. closure or or not opening uh, probably falls right. into play. Right. I mean that's a that's a big investment and and it's it's a costly one too because the cost of labor in this country is is pretty high. So, so I wonder what speeding up asset sales is that uh, land or factories or equipment that they're not using anymore is that what yeah, i believe yeah that would be what yeah. that would be like old tooling and, and oh yeah and, right makes sense and every time there's a model change of course you, you have tooling for making the old stuff that you're not necessarily using and and some of it goes to the parts program but but eventually it gets sold off and the, the cool thing is that that the aftermarket a lot of times snaps that up and and mm. uses it to make aftermarket replacement body panels, for instance. I wonder if that would include getting rid of some old inventory also, you know, if they're sitting yeah. on some cars. Yeah, yeah, that might, that, you're right, sure. They might uh, sell them at a, at a, a you know, less profit. For, uh, well, that price. would speed up the sale, so yeah. <laughs> the company said in its presentation it uh, has saved 300 million pounds since it initiated the turnaround plan six weeks ago and is working on 500 ideas for the future. <laughs> 500, um, huh? I know. I don't know. What. Because 499 would not be enough? <laughs> 501 would be too many, Harold. Yes. Right, exactly. <laughs> Retail sales of its Jaguar... 500 is the number, and the number is 500. 500. Retail sales of its Jaguar sedans and Land Rover Sport Utility vehicles fell 13.2% to about 130,000 units, hurt particularly by tariff changes in China, escalating trade tensions. We talked about that. Demand in China remaining, remained muted even after the country cut import tariffs for cars and car parts to 15% from 25% back in Maybe July. Maybe just take a while to get, get the stream going again. So moving on, tagging on to the turnaround plan, uh, Ralph Spath, who's the CEO of JLR, uh, talked to the Economic Times, then the Economic Times asked him some questions, and so I thought it was interesting to read some of his answers. And in the interest of uh, balance, I guess, it was, uh, it was nice. Uh, there, right after this, we're going to talk to the workers. Well, we're not going to talk to them. We're going to hear about what the workers have to say. So this is. Kind uh, of, I believe that's called giving equal time. Yeah, it just so happened. It was nice that there was a an article in the in the Birmingham uh, Live. I think it's called. Um, and talk to the workers. So right now we're going to hear from JLR management, and we can hear after this. Uh, so it's kind of a. Nice... And after the labor has their side of the story, does management get a, get a two minute rebuttal period? Uh, no. Okay. Not unless just they checking. Went, only. 
the rules of debate might apply here. They, so. may, they, they do not, but they are welcome, and I invite them onto the podcast if they want to talk about these matters. Ooh, that could be fun. That, that could be. Is it the toughest time JLR has faced under your leadership? And this is a long one because I think all of this is kind of interesting. JLR is facing a very tough time currently. We are facing external as well as internal challenges. Our geopolitical challenges, China has been one of our biggest markets in terms of profits as well as volumes. But the Chinese economic growth has come down to 6.6%. So the market has also declined by 7.7%. In the U.S., at a high level of GDP growth, there is hesitation to buy cars. Europe is witnessing a solid economic growth, 2-4%. to 4%, Yet, depending on the country, there we see the impact of worldwide harmonized light vehicle tests, WLTP, impacting demand. Our share of diesel powertrain in total sales is very high. Therefore, we are affected. In the UK, we are waiting for Brexit outcome impact, and no one can predict how it will affect us. We produce 2,500 to 3,000 cars a day and lots of engines out of the UK. We have to ensure that 25 million parts are at the right place at the right time. In the UK, there's a discussion on diesel, more so because the UK has diesel taxes and the latest technology on offer. I would like to reiterate that diesel is a very interesting engine. It is better on CO2 emission than petrol. And on particulate matter, the NOx, it is equal to a petrol engine. So there is a critical role for diesel in the future. All these challenges are coming together at the same time. What is WLTP? The harmonized light vehicle, worldwide harmonized light vehicle test. Does that have to do with diesels? Uh, no, I think it has to do with safety standards. Okay, I'm not sure. He... I'm not totally. I haven't read up on it, but but it sounds to me more like a, you know, it, it like because the thing is, there's different standards in different countries, and and you know that's of course why you can't import stuff into this country until it's 25 years old because it because other countries don't have the same standards. Oh, that makes okay. That makes some sense but then. Yeah. If we get everybody producing to the same standards, safety standards, and mm. same emission standards, then borders are much easier to cross. Right, and it's easier to produce one vehicle instead of five variants you know, for different countries. Absolutely, and that's that's why you know, for the longest time we had have in, in this country the emission standards. You have California emissions and you have 49 states, but right. most of the imported cars are coming into California standards because it's cheaper to make one than two. Yeah, I found his comments uh, further to be uh, interesting in that he kind of hits the point we talked earlier where things are just kind of in flux and no one's really sure. There's too many things going on. Tough, tough to right. respond to uh, to to focus on one because so many things are happening. But but we did get a little bit of, a, of the piece of the puzzle on China because he said their their economy is is slowing. That's what it sounds like he was trying to say. Well, well by almost the same amount as the sales were dropping. But it's but it's slowing for them more from what I'm reading elsewhere, not necessarily for everybody else. But maybe maybe it's just playing catch up. I don't know. Yeah, but if the economy, any sector of the economy in China slows, people aren't going to buy as many cars. Right. Uh, specifically, what is the de-risking strategy in case of an adverse Brexit scenario? And I admit I'm not reading all the questions here. You can go check them out yourself. I just thought the pull out these two. His answer: We recently made a one point. Four billion dollar investment in a new factory in Slovakia. We are ramping up slowly. We also have the opportunity to move from stage one to stage two. But I would like to highlight that JLR is a British company. We want to be in the UK. We want to produce largely in the UK. We have the best designers from the Royal College of Art. We have outstanding vehicles. Therefore, we would also like to be in the UK in the future. I hope on both sides of the channel, politicians find a way for a free and fair trade. I thought that was a good answer in the sense that, like, you know, we're UK, want to stay in UK. Can we work no, this that's, out? Yeah, that's yeah. a nice answer, and it's certainly yeah. political. But now I'm just thinking about the, the part about how, you know, politicians on both sides of the channel negotiating for a free and fair trade. That's kind of the whole point for being in the Euro European community <laughs> you in the first that. place. And you, and you go and quit that, and you still expect to be free and fair. It's like, yeah, you can't have it both ways, dude. Yeah, you noticed that, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which goes to his point about how the they're ramping up slowly. They invested in another part of Europe because they thought they could do this, and that's why though now they're moving slowly in Slovakia because as a result, because they, you know, well, and you just can't afford to go too big too quick either. But right. but I think that is part of their strategy in case Brexit doesn't work out the way they want. They're not producing everything in England. They've got, they're producing mm -hmm. some in the EC so that they're not 
dealing with tariffs there. As I said, we have now, from thanks to Birmingham Live, which is the Birmingham Mail in the UK. Birmingham Live is just the, I guess, the website name. And this has some... Uh, yeah, that's the, the online or digital version. So job loss, fears, and uncertainty inside JLR... Angry workers speak out. We've spoken to a number of workers stationed at plants across Birmingham and Sully Hall. And this is, what was this? This was uh, November 20th. Aggrieved staff at JLR plants have lifted the lid on anger and bitterness among colleagues. And one whistleblower revealing how most people are waiting for the, for the axe to swing. Hmm. It's the 1970s all over again. It, it sounds it sounds like. Let me scroll down to your... Some, some, some... Names have changed, but the activities are the same. Here's, here's a quote from one of the workers. The situation is mostly down to JLR trying to grow too big too quick. New starters have been given a false impression of life in a car factory. Most people are just waiting for the axe to swing. There is zero trust in the management of the company. And although Brexit is an issue, the vast majority of problems can be traced back to poor decisions when everyone, including myself, warned them. But yet again, JLR wouldn't listen. In most workers' opinions, unless Tata change how the place is run, there is no future. All right, whatever. Yes. I did like the... Mind you, that's typical labor response, not to get on, on a political oh, yeah. soapbox, but it's fairly common for the labor side of the equation to say, oh, management makes poor decisions. Well, maybe they don't. Maybe they do. I don't know. I think they're expressing there's uh, that one there. You can see expressing frustration and not knowing what's going on. And, but I think the reason for not knowing what's going on is because I don't think management knows what's going on <laughs> in the sense of why all these things are, as Space said, there's all these things going on and we're trying to deal with them all at once. And, and right. And they're still scrambling to figure out what they're going to do about it. They can't always like keep everyone fully informed while they'll st they're still trying to figure out what they're doing. Don't forget, they're work trying to work on 500 changes. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, the other th comment I thought there that I was nice to hear, at least because I've thought this, is that they, this at least you know one worker, mind you, but sounds like they're growing too quick, too uh, too big, too quick. I tend to, I, I've wondered yeah. about that. I, yeah, I, I think that's possible. I, uh, I'm fortunately, I, maybe a better way to put that in my mind is not that they were going too quickly. I think it was at the wrong time. They didn't know that these forces were going to happen and conspire against them. They might have been able to deal with one of them in one country. But no, all these things happening at once while they're trying yeah, to Yeah, I think up. timing kind of screwed them on some stuff. And it wasn't their fault necessarily. They did the decisions based on the info they had, but then the world changes. I would completely agree with that. Sometimes it goes your way and sometimes it does not. So moving on in this, uh, JLR, according to a manpower worker on the production line at Load Lane, has been, quote, too, re too reliant on selling diesel cars, unquote, and then there's nothing but negativity surrounding JLR. He said, and I guess this is the manpower worker who they call them agency workers. I think we'd call them, what, contract workers? The contracts or, or temp workers or something. A lot of the problems JLR face now is their own doing. Yes, the government isn't helping with the diesel situation, but I think JLR are too reliant on selling diesel cars. They built a new build hall and body shop at Sully Hall four years ago, along with new factories in Brazil, Slovakia, and China. Why didn't they adapt these buildings straight away and start building hybrid and electric cars back then? They could because have, the technology wasn't mature yet, and this guy doesn't understand that, of course. They could have gotten ahead of their competition rather than now playing catch-up with the likes of Tesla and BMW. I do, I do feel like these electric cars may be the company's one saving grace, though. They're just a bit too late to the party. I'm not sure you want to catch up with Tesla. Tesla is in worse shape financially than JLR is. That's not not something to aspire to. And then, Last I heard, they were still selling their stuff at a loss. I mean, it's great to drive the technology and, and to, to I mean, they've made great strides in improving uh, electric vehicles as a whole because of the things they're doing. But it's not like just because JLR, if they'd started four years ago doing this stuff, they'd be better. It's like, that's not how it works. Because you can only build to what the technology that exists is. I will agree with him in this not full electric, but definitely hybrid technology. I think they could have get have gotten on that faster. Well, right, and and and. But they did, and they are. The, I know that that's the big focus. They say one, they want to have everything electrified mm. by a certain amount. But that doesn't mean that diesels are going to go away. It just means there's going to be electric options, and that's that's a good play, good way to start. You know, have more right. options available sooner. Right. And I, and that's the reason why they had I believe they've had that program to get on it by 2020. They probably recognized that they needed to do that. They were kind of behind. They were focusing on building cars, uh, 
or, or well, their SUVs and modernizing them. Right. And unfortunately, they while they're working on reliability, they're working on capability, they're working on styling, and they're working on cutting uh, cutting some costs, cutting costs uh, yeah. to make profit. Those, those five hundred changes. Those, uh, yeah, well, and five hundred thousand more before that. Uh, right. They didn't have time to focus on creating a new powertrain. They were creating new. They had to create their their take their existing powertrains and, and, and modernize still them. So much development necessary to, before that becomes mm-hmm. better than what we already have, and that's what people don't understand. It's like just because somebody has shown that it works doesn't mean it's the best choice, and you can't just throw everything else away. It will be someday. Don't get me wrong. I mean, electric is coming in a big way, and eventually that's all we're going to have. And that's great when it's ready. Uh, you're, you're missing my point, um, which is fine. I, you, you make a good point. I'm talking about the hybrid stuff. They could have moved more towards hybrid faster, but then I would further contend. Right. I, I would they... agree with you there. They could have done more, but, I mean, this guy is saying they need to be an electric. It's like, well, it doesn't work that way. But anyway, yeah, right, go ahead. And then further, I would say they, they would probably – it's clearly they would have liked to have been into electric fi- electrified sooner but I don't think they had the time, attention, or money to do that. Right. They were, Budget, they, yeah. They were just trying to – I mean, their engines – some of their engines are still produced by Ford. They were trying to work to get off of that, to, to get right. into creating their own engine. So let alone right. work on their own engine and, oh, we should also come up with electric powertrain. Yeah. So that, that's just my take on on, on that. I, I suspect – I think these guys – you know, JLR people – well, no one in the car business is stupid. They see these things. They know what they're – they know what's happening before we – the consumer knows – I'm sure they were focused on it, but JLR was just trying to become uh, reliable. You know, they changed the model name here in the U.S. to try to to get away from the discovery being considered this you know unreliable hunk of crap. Right, right, uh, yeah. As an example, anyway, I guess. Well, we... they could have done better marketing around that, but any, but anyway, um, that's but yeah. a, a discussion <laughs> for another day. Yes. But Thank but I mean, I mean, really, if you look at at you know the 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 back office operating stuff, whatever you want to call it, I mean. You kind of hinted at this, but they're still trying to get themselves fully standalone. They're still trying to separate from the Ford era. Right. I mean, they were a Ford subsidiary for so long, and so much of their processes were integrated with Ford, which was great at the time. It gave them reliability and and a much better operating costs on on all their stuff because they had that that Ford juggernaut behind them but to to step out on their own and do it it is a big deal to change all of your processes and all of your suppliers and all your stuff and it takes time and what they're 10 years in they're still working at that uh and you made my point i was about to say do you know how long it's been since Tata took over it's been a decade it's been 10 years and they're still using some ford engines it's amazing well those are they're they're sweet engines i don't blame them but yeah well, it takes be. a while to develop something that can replace that in a good way and weren't they still using bmw engines based engines up until a few years ago <laughs> Uh, I think that stuff got phased out. Uh, it was only a couple of years ago. I don't think, I think it was long after Ford had them. They still had some BMW based engines, did they not? Um, That's my recollection. I don't think it was too long after they started putting the Jag engines in. Okay. In, in, mid, in the mid 2000s. No, then maybe I'm wrong. Okay. Because I know that the, the Disco 3 was a Jag plant, and I think by then the Range Rovers had switched over too, but it wouldn't have been but a couple of years. All right, well, let's uh, move on from the negative sales of uh, JLR, unfortunately, for for right. what for a good part of this uh, entire our run of the podcast. And things have been very positive up until the last few months. So, interesting. All right, well, JLR is going to open a, an office in Budapest, and this is an engineering office. They've announced And, and that- this, this coattails on, on what we've been talking about. The more things they can do in Europe... Uh, they can sort of skirt Brexit to a certain extent. Yeah, they're going to open a technical engineering office in Budapest, Hungary, early next year to support the management of its European supply chain. It follows the official opening, as, as we know, yep. about the Slovakia plant. Uh, Nick Rogers, executive director of product engineering, said the office would support JLR's collaboration with suppliers located in Central and Eastern Europe. Right, in order to step up that, that gradual growth in, in Europe. I thought this was interesting that uh, why they chose Hungary, along with JLR, BMW announced in August that it would be building a one million pound euro assembly plant. And Mercedes-Benz is already building a second plant 
uh, based on a flexible production concept. And those cars are supposed to roll off the line in the 2020s. And Audi has been present in the country since 1993. So it must mean there's a good talent base there to draw from. Right. Something, and per- perhaps a favorable economy. Right. And not far from Slovakia. Right. And by the way, the, my apologies for not reading the Hungarian city names, but uh, I figured better to just not do that. And it's too late in the day to, to attempt to not butcher that. You, you'd think as having an East European background, I would know, but I don't. Yeah, one would think. Uh, JLR backs new multi-million pound driverless car center. So JLR has pledged to support a new multi-million pound research and engineering center for driverless cars. The Smart City Mobility Center will combine autonomous and electric vehicle research to help put the UK at the forefront of mobility technology. The creation of the Midlands-based center was announced at the Coventry and Warwickshire Automotive Dinner with the Warwickshire Manufacturing Group chairman saying... And this is the first time in any country that such a comprehensive system is being designed and tested. That's that's more than what they're doing here, like at CMU. Well, I think as a from a governmental side of it, uh, what, oh, okay, what I guess. All right. yeah, uh, what, yeah. I, I was thinking engineering side, but okay. well, you know that's interesting. It's a good point because Uber has teamed up with CMU here in Pittsburgh uh, to do you know some of the self driving cars and test those on the streets. But maybe this is also in, maybe something more formal. But I don't know. Actually, they're supposed to endow a chair. Or something. I don't know. I have to, should, we should do research. Uh, JLR Chief Executive uh, Ralph Spath said, JLR welcomes the center, which will create state-of-the-art electric vehicle modular architectures and integra- integrated driverless capability to support smart cities of the future. It builds on collaboration between JLR, WMG, the University of Warwick, and the government to develop 5G connectivity in the region. Blah, 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 transform okay, customer. And it, they're hoping to get rid of traffic accidents and reduce emissions and all that fun stuff. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if used for the right reasons in the right way, it's it could be pretty cool. Maybe uh, back in the in the sub headline here, Harold, maybe this is what is the difference between what's going on here in Pittsburgh. Midlands based city smart city mobility center will test new vehicles and systems. And this is, the I think, the important part to reduce accidents, congestions and emissions. I don't think that's what Uber is doing. Uber is just trying to get uh, driverless cars to work. Okay. Well, minute, I mean, minutes. that's a good place to start, getting them to work. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then figure out better ways to use them is kind of right. step two. Right. Uh, JLR makes breakthrough in cure for motion sickness. Tata Motors' uh, owned brand has pioneered a, a new technique that could reduce cases of motion sickness by at least 60%. Using a variety of test vehicles and other JLR facilities, the firm's wellness research engineer... My old job. Spencer Salter has worked out a way to measure what he terms an individual's wellness score or measure of a person's susceptibility to motion sickness to give it its uh, motion sickness. This score is calculated using a device that is still in development and undergoing patent approval, so the details are sketchy. But the technology uses non-invasive biometric sensors that record physiological signals. By combining this data with motion and dynamics data, the vehicle is then able to tell someone is becoming motion sick before they experience any symptoms. These sensors are likely to be placed somewhere discreet, such as on the door handles. The score they capture are then put through a complex algorithm by the vehicle Vehicles, computer, and a dynamic and cabin features are then adapted according to the individual score. The plan is to save these settings for future journeys. So, so like, like you know, it's your your key fob or whatever. When you punch it, it knows that you're going to be in it, and you get this amount of sick. And the I other get... person punches their key fob, and then it knows that they're going to be that amount of sick. And M- maybe it stiffens the suspension on one side of the vehicle more than the other, or. In the rear De- versus the front, automatically uh, deploys the sick bags from under the dash. dash. Uh, maybe it pumps in more fresh air versus less fresh air. I'm not sure what all the things that cause motion sickness, but I always figured that you know the solution they had back in the 1940s was a lot simpler. Car, the car would fail to start. There'd be no motion, hence no sickness. No sickness. I always thought it was just don't ride with those people. Well, yeah, yeah. that's that's yeah. been my my rule. You're gonna be sick. Don't be in my car. Me car. Get your own car. And if you're gonna if you're gonna ride with me, you just deal. No, I know for some people it's a physiological. Yeah, it it really is a problem for some people. But but yeah, I mean there's yeah, I mean there are other solutions out there. But it's kind of cool to see a vehicle maker try to do something to address that. It's neat. It's interesting. 
of course, whether I, it'll work or not, I don't know, but it's interesting. I wonder, are they doing this just on road? What about off road? <laughs> Had to throw that out. Of course, it might be speed dependent. Is it? It's got to be speed dependent too, because isn't it more like this? Your brain has trouble processing the speed of that you're going versus what you see in the outside. Isn't it something where like you need to see? Well, yeah, because a lot of times if you close your eyes and just sort of try to focus on relaxing, you can make it go away. So it's that it's that like peripheral vision thing. I think where you you see stuff moving faster than you should be. Something like that. Yeah, because you can get motion sickness, what, like on amusement park rides, too. Uh, I've gotten motion sick in an IMAX. Yeah, there we go. That makes sense. Moving on, we'll get into some vehicle news. The Range Rover Velar is the 2019 Motor Trend SUV of the Year finalist. Subheading this. Which means it's not the SUV of the year yet, yet. but it soon could be because it's, it's on the short list. It is, I think. Although the short list, I think, is like twenty-five vehicles. But anyway, uh, well, you have an everybody, everybody in their cousin makes an SUV, so you know it's going to be a big list to start with. True. Uh, their likes stunning design, compliant ride, all road capability. They don't like digital user interface. Interior. Huh. Imagine that interior trim glare, poor price uh-huh. value. So there's that list of complaints we've heard already. Indeed. Uh, I like this uh, kind of a one-paragraph review, I suppose. I'll read this one. If the Jeep Wrangler is an analog off-roader, the Velar is its digital future with its various uh, drivetrain and suspension modes. Oh, why do they use the Wrangler? Why don't they use the Defender as the example there, since they're made by the same company? Oh, because it's Motor Trend. I suspect it's... Yeah, exactly. American idiots, but okay, anyway. Uh, suspension when it's selectable uh, rather, uh, by touch rather than tugging at levers, which would be fine if, if the Velar's touchscreen user interface and switches were fast, intuitive, and reliable. Unfortunately, they're not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Quote, when it comes to using this interior, nothing is easy. Uh, Christian uh, Seabaugh grumbled. I think he's uh, one of the people who helped write the article. Bad electronics are ruining an otherwise nice car for me. Electronics ruin everything most of the time, so I'm, I'm with you on that. But well, you're with him, not me. The Hope, that's I'm talking to him, but anyway. Fair enough. The Hope uh, Couture interior has only one glaring design fault, literally. Sunlight reflected off the shiny aluminum on the center console is blinding, bad enough to be a deal breaker for customers in Sunbelt states. Eh, give it a month or two to get all dull and, and grubby, and then that won't be a glare anymore. It'll, uh, just, be ugly. it'll just be ugly. Uh, apparently, take it to your local Land Rover dealer, and they will scuff it up for you for free. Well, that's the black, shiny black plastic yep. parts, not the aluminum stuff. But uh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure if you ask, they will help you out. Yeah, they can probably hook you up on the other. What for ninety thousand dollars? I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, on the road, the Velar is defined by great body control and chassis balance, enhanced by delicate steering, remarkably strong handling for a car this big. It feels uh, really planted, uh, but the 380 horsepower V6 is grainy at idle and under load. The 100, 180 horsepower diesel is, apart from startup, smoother and more efficient, but it takes almost twice as long to get the 4,500 pound Velar to 60 miles per hour. It's funny that the diesel is smoother than the petrol variant. I know. <laughs> exactly. That says good things about the diesel, but it also says a lot of not so good things about the petrol. Right. Yes. Yes. Exactly. And, well, and everyone's complaining. They're focusing on on diesels and see this is what happens. Well, you know, when you make a good one, why not? Why wouldn't you? That's right. Moving to future models, the 2020 Land Rover Range Rover Evoque will get full plug-in hybrid option. It's a good. A 48-volt mild hybrid is big news. So the all-new second-gen Evoque has been revealed, opting against a, a Range Rover opting against a conventional auto show debut in favor of an event at an old brewery in London's hipster-friendly Shoreditch district. This is, after all, a car aimed squarely at trendy young urbanites, or so the presentation wants us to believe. Uh, Evoque buyers are younger than Land Rover's other customers, more tech-savvy, well, more environmentally... That's because it's your cheapest Range Rover. It's going to be your entry-level rangy. Uh, more tech-savvy, more environmentally conscious, and more interested in sustainability. Little surprise, these are the messages given greatest prominence from the uh, boast. Each Evoque contains as much as 70 pounds of recycle, recycled material 
in its construction to the arrival of JLR's first 48-volt mild hybrid powertrain, MHELV, uh, on the 296 horsepower version. The key enabler for all this is the Evoke's premium transverse architecture, PTA, we talked about that before, which is 99% new and shares nothing more than door hinges with the outgoing version. The extended 100 point, uh, 105.6 inch wheelbase is identical to that of the E-Pace, and the new Evoke also gains a version of that car's inter integral link rear suspension. But Land Rover engineers insist that this is an all-new foundation and not a further evolution of the DA platform that can trace its ancestry all the way back to the Ford era. The most important feature of the new PTA platform is the ability to house various hybrid configurations without intruding on, Im on the improved interior space. At launch, we'll get the MHEV option, which is the mild hybrid, which uses an underfloor battery pack connected to a belt-driven motor generator on the side of the 2-liter turbocharged gasoline engine. This configuration enables far smoother integration of start-stop technology, electric torque boost, and torque fill to flush out the turbocharged engine's power delivery. Well, isn't that interesting? It belt drives to the engine. Huh. So is that while the turbo is spooling up, the electric is going to fill in the gap? Uh, well, yeah, it would do that. Is that what, is that what the f torque fill is about? Uh, yeah, that's, torque I, I think that's what they mean by that. Oh, here we go. But Ford. they would certainly do that because the, the hybrid is going to be able to boost the engine at, at zero RPM or, or at idle instantly. And I have an example here. When coasting up to a stoplight, the gasoline motor cuts out far earlier, now 11 miles per hour, to contribute a 6% improvement in fuel consumption. Meanwhile, the all-wheel drive chassis features driveline disconnect to run in front-wheel drive only and reduce transmission losses when you don't need four four-wheel drive. Did I say that right? So it's going to it's going to run in front-wheel drive only right. when you don't need when you don't need four-wheel drive. Uh, the bigger news from Land Rover's hybrid integration manager, and that is a that's my former job. Uh, I like saying that now. Hybrid integration manager David Skipper concerns the pending PHEV. That's, that's what partial hybrid. And plug-in hybrid. Plug-in hybrid, uh, which can combines 197 horsepower, three-cylinder, 1.5-liter version of the Ingenium gasoline engine driving the front wheels with a 107-horsepower electric motor powering the rear axle. As such, the Evoque PHEV will be able to run as a front-wheel drive gasoline power car, rear-wheel drive electric-only vehicle, or as a smart all-wheel drive with both power sources combined. Well, that ought to be a pretty spectacular launch mode, too, with that much power for the <laughs> rear wheels. Oh, that would be. Oh, yeah. I wonder if it's. Oh, will this be the first Land Rover with launch control? Yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, it, it, the numbers aren't huge, but I'm just thinking of the torque bias and stuff. It ought to right. make a, for an interesting track car. That would. Until you run the batteries down. But, but yeah, it's. Yeah, you know. A couple good launches out of it ought to be interesting. Yeah, but then you have the gasoline to get you home. Right. I think this is the end of the article, uh, last thing to read here, but it's clear the plan for 90% of new Evokes to be sold with some sort of hybridization have substance to it. Expect pricing and further information in the not-too-distant future. The new Evoke will make its formal stateside debut at the Chicago Auto Show in February. Interesting they're going with Chicago, not New York or Detroit. Yeah. I believe we've heard that other manufacturers have been de-emphasizing Detroit over the last couple of years, right? We have heard that. New York was sort of becoming the, the big one. It was, it was taking over some of Detroit's business. Just yeah. interesting that Chicago is now sort of in the running for new debuts. Well, maybe too much going on in New York and L.A., and maybe Land Rover thought it could get a little more splash. I don't know. Guess we'll find out. Our favorite new segment of the month is the new Defender Watch Information uh, as I said to somebody on Instagram, can, should we not be calling it, instead of New Defender, should we not be calling it the Defender Series 2? No, you don't like it. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know. I'm just trying to, I, I'm, yeah, I mean, you could argue that the Puma spec was kind of the Defender Series 2. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess we're, yeah, it's some sort of, evol you know, it's definitely an evolution. It's whether Series 2 is enough of a distinction, I don't know. It was. Partly in jest, but it would, it, I kind of like the idea instead of, you know, new Defender, Defender Series 2. Anyway, there's a... Well, well, I mean, the other hand, they could take a rip a page out of the Volkswagen playbook and just call it the new Defender. And then in about five more years, the next one will just be called the Defender again. Indeed, yes, that's right. Like they did with the Beetle. Beetle, yeah. And then eliminate it completely. Right. 
2020 Land Rover Defender shows For off instance, its... instance, yes, but let's not go that far. So the 2020 Land Rover Defender shows off its short wheelbase. So first, this is from uh, Autoblog again. First, we saw... Yeah, as opposed to the to the other one we've seen, which is the not-quite-so-short wheelbase. Well, I think that's what they're referring to here. The first, we saw a short wheelbase Defender Mule wearing a very chopped-up disco sport bodywork and a weak attempt to hide in plain sight. I think that's probably what they're referring to, but I'm not sure. That didn't work, but also perhaps it wasn't supposed to. A JLR seemed to re- to re- revel in releasing camouflage prototypes into the wild to be "quote unquote" accidentally captured by spy photographers. I tend to agree. With I, that. I still think it would make a good coffee table book. You know, development camos of of, of Rover. I, I completely agree. So that's out there. There's another one. Take a look at the pictures. Very boxy. Uh, there's not much, nothing new in this specific article to read, but you can see uh, out in some nice photos from the rear, front, and side. And definitely in the rear, it's going to be a side opening door because you can tell by the door handle. Uh, it does have short and the approach and departure angles. We'll see how boxy it really looks. There's definitely a, it appears to be a seam down the side, although that could be some excess cladding put on there to confuse things. And the one I saw, which if it's in the UK, it appeared that the driver was on the left-hand side of the vehicle. Maybe that was further confusion. I don't know. Or they're testing for the continent or something. And then there was another article from MotorOne.com. The Land Rover Defender Sport is coming in 2026. <laughs> So, so just a year after the, the Defender itself finally gets around to coming out. <laughs> when a new Land Rover... Since I'm not sure I'm buying that 2020 anymore, but maybe. We'll I, see. I think that's coming. Yeah, uh, that one might actually happen, but it, I'm just tired. Because it's been 2016, 17, 18. Please don't pound. With a new Land... my point home, but anyway... With a new Land Rover Defender in development, as evident by the spy photos, the British automaker is hoping to evolve the model's image past its tough and rugged go-anywhere exterior. The next Defender will not only move the nameplate more upscale, but it will also eventually offer a plethora of submodels. We've known all this before, but it's good to hear it all right. together. They'll also take their time to get there. The new Defender, with a model uh, ending in 2016, will go on sale as a 2020 model, which is still several months away. However, those wanting a new Defender Sport will have to wait even longer, as you heard in the title, 2026. According to a new report from Carr, the, Defen- the Defender Sport won't debut until 2026. Codenamed L860, the Defender Sport is will further move. Well, that's a... Okay, good. It's not me. It's a typo in their in their article. Good. The Defender Sport will move will further move the model into the luxury arena. While it will still sport Land Rover's famous off-road prowess, the Defender Sport will be an off-road vehicle for the well-to-do, which we kind of thought was going to happen, but right. Not interesting to hear. And there's more stuff to read, but blah blah. blah. I, I'm hoping they come up with a Defender Light at some point, something that's been decontented <laughs> for the for the the utility market. Yeah, I, I suspect that's possible. The, the It's possible. Whether yeah. they'll do it and be able to make money at it is another story. When I read these articles, I still have this feeling like they told Jerry, leave the room. We're, we got this now. Mm-hmm. Go right. sit at the kids' table for a while, let the grown-ups talk. That's Land Rover-specific news, general car news, which is Rover-related. Uh, Enios, off-road car decision expected. Did I say Enios right? Is that how you say that? Uh, not, I'm not sure. I think it might be Enios, but yeah, it, close enough. We're in there. It's a chemical company that's uh, thinking about building a Land Rover-esque car inspired by Land Rover. I guess they tried to buy it. Uh, that, that's the one that was Project Grenadier? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right, right. Project with a K, as I recall. Yes, you're correct. Yes, Project with a K. Makes it sound more more European that way, I mm-hmm. guess. There's some thought that uh, they might try to buy part of the plant or the plant that Ford has in uh, Bridge End. There's some rumors there, um, maybe trying to buy that because I think that plant is going to be closing soon. You well, hope? it might be. Yeah, you, you buy one that's already uh, set up to build build cars. It's probably cheaper than building a new one. Right. Oh, it's a uh, Ford engine plant in Bridge End. Yeah, it's that's a, all right. It's in Wales. You, you, you can build cars there. Oh, sure. And Enios, uh, another article here. Motor Authority says Enios uh, hopes to build between fifteen thousand and twenty thousand units annually, and they want to market it worldwide. Although I don't, if they're going to, I'm not sure if they'll be able to make it to the U- U.S. if it's based on the old Defender, but who knows. Pricing hasn't been discussed, but there's some thinking it might be $65,000. I assume that is American. And the vehicle would be aimed at mining explorers, forestry workers, farmers, and on-off-road enthusiasts. 
my kind of guys. So would that be the old Defender then? Or uh, would... Yeah, I think that's that was everything I read about the whole project was that, I mean, this is sort of a, a new vehicle based on the old Defender trying to get back to the roots, if you will, since Land Rover's clearly gone modern high tech with the new Defender. If that's the case, then it's not. it will definitely not be available in the U.S. It's not going to... I think it would be tough unless they sold it as an off-highway only for, for like, you're talking about forestry people and, and mining people. You could sell it as a... As a as a non street legal, mm, gotcha. It wouldn't be t- it wouldn't be titled as an on road vehicle. Correct. Moving on, we talked about this uh, last month, but we now have actual pictures. Selfridges unveils custom Land Rover. So you may recall that Land Rover had disassembled a rebuilt and remodeled uh, Defender Works Defender. Ooh, a lot of Defenders there. And took it into Selfridges and was rebuilding it. So now we have photos of it, and they will play host to a special one-off Land Rover built just for the department store. And Selfridges, the Selfridges edition Land Rover was actually a moderately less exciting Defender 110 2.2 TDCI pickup in Coventry nearly five months ago. And then uh, Land Rover took and did some changes to it. So what sets this Land Rover apart from the others? Besides the fact that it resides in a department store and took 930 hours to complete, well, there's a number of special touches like bronze green paint, a branded hood in trademark Selfridge's yellow, retro style seats with custom stitching, and unique Selfridge badging. For the Americans, when they say hood, we would call that roof and the canvas top. Right. Yeah, it took me a moment. It was like hood when like oh I, when i looked at the pictures i'm like the hood or the the bonnet as a british would call it the hood's not yellow oh okay it took me a moment i remember the change there yeah hood means roof bonnet means hood uh, the car is something of a joint birthday present for both land rover and selfridges land rover is currently celebrating its 70th birthday while the department store will turn 110 next year so they used a 110 for their okay. of course they did they'd be stupid not to the london store in oxford street first opened in 1909 Two years after company founder Harry Gordon Selfridge arrived in Britain from the United States. And hopefully they'll be around in another 20 years because they could do it again with a 130. Ooh, or a 127. Well, they could do it a little, a little early if they used a 127. Does that mean Selfridges is an American company? Or, uh, or Amer- well, it was started by, an American, started by an American, sorry. It was founded by an American, but yeah. in England. So, yeah, it's kind of hard to call it an American company. Although this you know unique uh, British icon, we have two of them now. We have the, the Land Rover as an I- a British icon, Selfridge is kind of a British icon, and one was started by an American, and the other was inspired by an American. And owned by an American for a while. All right, let's move into event reports. Uh, first up is URE15, the Old North State Land Rover Society hosted URE15, or URE, because it took place in the URE National Forest in North Carolina. October 19th through the 21st, 2008. Uh, go out and check out the article if you want to read about Yuari, but it's down there one time. Really neat place. I've never been to this event. but I've heard good things sure. about it, though. I've not been, but, it looks, but a lot people I've talked to said it's a good event. Yeah, it looks interesting. Bill Fischel and I went to Yuari after Mar one year, and uh, we weren't actually part of it. I don't know if they had started the event yet because I'm, it's been a long time. It's maybe more than 15 years, but maybe in the beginning stages. But we bounced around a lot in Bill's <laughs> Series 3. <laughs> well, you know, that doesn't say much. You're in a series truck. You're going to bounce around a lot no matter what. It was so bad I knew not to take my Freelander off-road. Pretty okay. Easy. Well, your Freelander thanks you for that, I guess. It did. It definitely did. Uh, the other event is the Rovers on the Rocks and Harold and I attempted to make it, <laughs> and we didn't make it. We were going to go up for the day. Uh, so if you were there and didn't see us, I do apologize. Uh, we got as far as State College in the morning. What, about 10 o'clock, I think, we got to State College? We got up bright and early before the sun came up. I picked up Harold. We were heading out, and then the Defender, everything was going fine. And then all of a sudden, a lot of tra- traffic picked up. It was getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And then we could see on the other side, uh, the, the clouds kind of, well, excuse me, the clouds came in. We were starting to go up into the up into the mountain. Ball, I think it's Bald Eagle Mountain. And the clouds were moving in, and then it started to kind of lightly snow. And then it didn't really snow heavily, but you could, there was definitely snow snow happening. And, and we could see uh, not many cars on the other side. And then they were coming like onesies and twosies and going very, very slow. And then we started going very, very slow. And then all of a sudden, we came to a stop. We were stopped for, what, about 20 minutes to a half an hour? And thankfully, the sun came out by that point the the squall had happened a squall a snow squall had happened and the because we were up in the mountains the wind blew over the road it was very cold 
and uh, the road iced over. Yeah, it was very, very icy. And Harold and I decided... As evidenced by somebody who got out of the truck to take a leak and almost ended up flat on his ass. Several, uh, um, Not only on the departure, but the return to the vehicle. Yes. So I said we stopped because there was a, an overpass ahead of us, went up a hill. So that you, as soon as you got into the overpass and it started going up a hill, and cars decided to stop there and not try it until an assault truck came. And that was a good half hour or so. And we evaluated time and conditions and decided, you know what, Let's, uh, we'll turn around. I don't mind the snow. Well, we, we watched the salt truck on the, the lane for the opposing traffic coming the other way. Oh, that's it right. Got a, that, that bridge was iced up as well, and there was a van turned sideways, and the salt truck had to get around that. But then once it did, the salt truck spun sideways. He did. He did. I remember you that. know you got an icy road when the salt <laughs> truck can't even get traction. Yeah, he was he spun sideways. Yeah. I don't mind snow and I don't mind rain, but uh, ice just no nah, there's no fun there. No fun at all. But well we didn't install the studs in the tires before we left. No, no. Uh I did hear from uh folks that went they had a really good time and our friend Bob Scottish Bob, we like to call him, he did win an award while he was there. So it was apparently a really good time. I know Heidi did make it. She went later than us and didn't have any problems. And she was able to uh, scatter um, some of Dave's ashes there. So his, his one of his. I favorites. wonder how, how Dave's fundraiser went. I, uh, hope that, I hope that was helpful. I believe it was. My, my understanding is it went very well. Well, good. So that's the event. Sorry we didn't make it. We did risk management, and we decided to uh, call it. And finally in the news, this just came in. I saw this today. 87-year-old to retrace epic Singapore to London Drive. Yes, Mr. Slesser plans to drive from Singapore to London next year. He's going to reprise the first over, I guess, the return trip of the first overland back in 55-56. Question is, is somebody else in their 80s going with him? I don't know. Uh, the article is with the Straight Times. I assume that's out of Singapore, and I was not subscribing to read the rest of the article. But I did reach out to Adam Bennett, and I said, asked Adam, what's happening? Is this, is this true and anything that we can tell our listeners? And he said, yes, it's happening, and that if they're going to ship— Well, me, if Adam said it's happening, you know it will. They're going to go ahead and ship everything from London very soon uh, to Singapore. And he did say that if uh, things fall through and people don't uh, you know, complete the actions that they need to complete, he himself will— fly to Singapore and drive it back himself. Well, yeah, of course, he may have to, you know, like buy a ship or steal a container to, to get it there. <laughs> he said, last plan, if everyone lets me down, I will fly out and drive back to UK by myself. <laughs> and he said, the, the last time the end point was at the AAA, uh, AA club in London. Cool. I thought he might return to the Grenadier pub, but he said it was the AA. So good luck to Adam Bennett and especially to Tim Slesser. We want to know what happens. What happens next will be. And that's the news for November 2018. And now on this Understeer podcast, joining us from Los Angeles, California, I'm in my best uh, Phil Collins voice, because uh, I remember <laughs> Phil, I'm a big Genesis fan. Keep trying. I know. Why am I already laughing? <laughs> <laughs> it's, he would say, uh, uh, Daryl Sturmer from Los Angeles, California. I just remember that. Anyways, it's Kathy Eldon. <laughs> Kathy, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Uh, very excited to have you on the show. Well, thank you, and I'm already giggling. So you <laughs> you you've got me. You got me at hello. <laughs> Sweet, that's great. Uh, Kathy is uh, the is the mother of Dan Eldon, and Dan Eldon uh, was a, a, I guess a journalist. Is that a good photojournalist? A photojournalist, artist, uh, explorer. Yeah, all of uh, those things. I and, would say. And for our purposes, he was a. Uh, a Land Rover nut. He was an avid enthusiast of, of, of Land Rovers. He tragically died in 1993 in Somalia, and uh, there was a, a movie uh, made about his life called uh, The uh, Destination is the Journey. Or no, The Journey uh, is the Destination. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> The Journey is the Destination, as all Land Rovers will, uh, uh, fun, fans will agree, I would say. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, you know, we're respectful, certainly, of the situation, but, you know, it's a Land Rover podcast, and we want to talk about Land Rover, so, Kathy, let's uh, let's get to it. And, and the important things that, that he did in them. 
Indeed. Uh, exactly. Well, we don't want to talk about all the things he might have done in them, but we'll just definitely <laughs> concentrate on the exploration and yeah, the travels. We, we are a bit of a family show, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, I did watch on, the movie, yeah. so I can only imagine. Yeah. You can only imagine. Well, and thank you, guys. Um, Dan was brought up in Nairobi, Kenya, so he was surrounded by Land Rovers. And this was back in, um, he, we moved to Kenya in 1977. So uh, obviously, you know, they were the vintage, fabulous, creaky, crink, but go on forever. And when he was 16, I think he convinced his grandparents in Iowa to, um, I think he was 17, to give him $5,000 from his college fund because he wanted to take what he called not a year off, but a year on. He wanted to buy a Land Rover and travel to South Africa, explore the continent and really then travel many places and, and learn from being in those places rather than going to college that first year. So my poor parents uh, ponied up, you know, advanced him money from the college fund, which was probably the best money they've ever spent, because with it, he bought Desiree, a 1971 um, short wheelbase vehicle, who as was as temperamental as her name. <laughs> she was <laughs> named after an Italian wild Italian friend of his who lived in Nairobi. Fair. And he began his first adventure at the age of 17, which was setting off for South Africa with two friends, hapless friends. <laughs> <laughs> so he's written about it extensively. And most, you know, nobody's ever seen the writing. Uh, but I'm, I'm in talking with you, I feel like I should publish those, that account. Absolutely. Because it's hysterically funny, <laughs> and, and it um, the friends were fed up and annoyed, and you know throwing dishes and cutlery and things. But they made it down to South Africa, or they made it down to Malawi, I believe. And en route, they 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 discovered a refugee camp where there were fifteen thousand people who literally had nothing, and they didn't have a well. They the folks were wearing one type of material, you know, some German. Uh, missionaries sent b bolts of, of cloth and all the little girls were wearing exactly the same dresses because they had one bolt of cloth. But it, mm. it really moved Dan. And he vowed to come back uh, the next year to try to bring aid to the people so they can help themselves. So the, uh, Desiree took him on an adventure that triggered a desire to really help others. Um, and so the next year he uh, was at Pasadena Community College in America, uh, trying to become a resident so that he didn't have to pay heavy school fees so that he could, you know, divert more money from the college fund um, <laughs> to more Land Rover adventures. But he gathered together 15 friends to take Desiree back uh, uh, overland again to South Africa or, you know, to, to Malawi, to the refugee camp to bring that aid. And Amazingly enough, on the safari, there were 15 kids in two Land Rovers. So Dan bought another Land Rover, no, Land Cruiser. Sorry, evil word, but yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, but Arabella. Oh, it's all um, good. It's all good. We're, she was no just hates. as temperamental. <laughs> but Arabella and Desiree traveled across Africa. Now, on that safari was a guy named Christopher Nolan. Oh, now, yeah. if you've ever seen Batman or, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yep. Chris Nolan is one of the most famous uh, act uh, directors in the world, and at that time he did a cute little, you know, student film of the kids traveling across Africa. So that was one of his first yeah. film projects. Yeah, I think he's a he's a car guy too, because I mean the Chris Nolan Batman's had the best Batmobiles. Oh, you bet, yep. absolutely. Yep. And underneath every Batmobile is, you know, is a Land Rover desperate to, you know, change her identity or something. I don't know, <laughs> but um, or something, so, or something. So uh, on that trip, Lord knows what was going on in those Land Rovers because there were um, fifteen teenagers uh, on. Yeah, seven you, you don't want to know. <laughs> I yeah, don't yeah, believe me. I don't. My per? daughter was fifteen on that trip. So. Totally. Oh my! Yeah, you oh, do yeah. not want to know. No, she was a good. She, I, I know. Yeah, they, oh, well, I, 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 it was a, it was a lively trip. The kids <laughs> went through the Tet Corridor, which was a very dangerous place. That was. Um, you know, fraught with, I think there were landmines and uh, a lot of baddies and blowing up stuff. You saw it actually in the film. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, John, yes. if you, 
yeah, and the journey is a destination. They actually reenact that. And by the way, on that film, we had two Land Rovers, and both of them would break down at the same time, so that they actually had to push the Land Rovers uh, <laughs> to do to do some of those scenes. But that may not surprise you, people. Uh, no, no. But you not, not so much. No. So, although a lot of times you'll find that uh, one is always working. Like the first two or three, there's always at least one working. So it's kind of it's well. That's nice the there. reason why you have to have multiple Rovers in your fleet. That right. way, it increases your chance of having one operational at any given time. <laughs> the possibility is there, but unfortunately, and these were South African, you know, mechanics who were trying to keep it going, but mm. um, there was one day, critical day, and both of them broke down. So we had to, to tow the Land Rover up to the top of the hill and then push it. So in the film, they had to speed up the, you know, speed up the frames because it was going at such a leisurely place down the hill. <laughs> well, you know, they don't go fast, so. <laughs> no, they don't go fast. Anyway, they, they usually go faster thing. downhill, mind you. Well, you would have thought. So basically, um, Dan, they, they donated Arabella, the land cruiser, um, to, to the Save the Children organization in, uh, no, World Vision in South Africa, excuse me, in Malawi at the camp, but it was a question of whether they even wanted to take it because it was so broken down and, and <laughs> they had they had to leave money to sort of do her up. Not necessarily but, a charitable donation. Not exactly. Uh, maybe somebody could sleep in it or something with the orphans and, and who knows. But they traveled yeah, Raise chickens or something. Something like that. Chickens is a good idea. Who, who knew? But Dan traveled on to South Africa at that time and the rest of the kids flew back because who wanted to travel all the way back to, to, to Kenya in, in a rickety Land Rover? Right. But I would. The, you would. There you go. That's yeah. good. Uh, so for the next couple of years, Dan uh, Desiree resided in Nairobi. And Dan flew back and forth from L.A. because he was going to UCLA. And when he'd arrive in Kenya, he'd crawl into Desiree. And by then, he'd stripped away her roof the the the, the um the side you know the sides of the vehicle so she was just like a a, a naked Desiree she was just this cool uh you know like the wind whistling through her hair as it were yeah. um like a pickup? so that was it it, it 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 lost the top and the sides so more of a pickup it was like an open like a convertible yeah it was maybe. just open yeah. well and topless top she was topless totally topless <laughs> in this wild Desiree and half the time in the shop and in Kenya, the shop is outdoors as well. You know, they have something called juakali, which means you work, it's hard work in the sun. Sorry, all these things, hard work in the sun. And you just take the vehicle and the, all the mechanics are just kind of in this area and you, and you, you watch carefully because God knows, you know, by the time you leave, you could have a lot fewer bits that are original. Not that anything's original with, with Land Rover. But anyway, Desiree stayed there and Dan bought another Land Rover named Big Blue. And Big Blue lived in England. And Big Blue had gingham, a red gingham curtains, and it was all very sort of British picnic sort of stuff, you know? Do you know so, what uh, year and model that was? I think she was about a 70, maybe like more like 77, 78. I've got pictures I can send to you. Probably Wait, series, big, three. series three. Yeah. yeah, something like series three. So Big Blue actually, um, she traveled down um, she traveled down to Morocco. Dan took um, his best friend, Lengai, who had traveled with him to South Africa, and Amy, and they went cross-country, cross-overland to Morocco uh, and Casablanca. And then they, yeah, I think they, I think they had to, to, to put her on a ferry and take her across the ferry, you know, to, to Casablanca. And there, of course, Big Blue broke down for three weeks. Dan had to travel, uh, to, uh, stay there. And he was actually accosted at one point where somebody was trying to kill him, stuck his hand through the window. Right. And Dan had a spark plug brush, you know. He kept a spark plug brush in, in the, you know, handy. And he clawed at the person who then ran away and, and, and he survived. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So the good thing is that because of bad spark plugs, Dan was saved. So go. that's good, See? right? That's right. Oh, yeah. A wire, br yeah. wire brush to the rescue. There you go. Yeah. Keep it in mind, people. <laughs> you know? Creative use of tools. Exactly. Oh, my, mind you, I forgot to tell you that when they were in um, tra traveling with the kids, uh, they were going down a hill very fast. 
in the dangerous area of the Tet Corridor. And suddenly the gear shift, um, unfortunately, pulled out Ooh. with, um, yeah. And so Lengai was holding it the gear happens. shift. You've, you've heard of that before? Oh, yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, they, they fall off, they break off. Yeah, stuff happens. Oh, that's great. Well, so there they were, these kids with eight kids in the back of the car going down a hill, uh, probably faulty brakes and no gear, stick shift. So they, they stuck a screwdriver in mm-hmm. and somehow managed to shift the car and nobody yep. died. Yep. And they're Again. done that. Yeah, then they're done that. You guys are mad. Uh, and then there was a time that they were heading up the Ingong Hills, which are these wonderful rumbly hills in Kenya. And they came to a, a, an area that they never should have been trying to go up. And the car tipped over by about 47 degrees or I don't know, or 80. I have no idea. Maybe 78 degrees. And it was just going, you know, kind of wobbling on two wheels. Wow. And then they all crawled over to the left side and then looked it down on the ground. But I don't know. You've done that, too, I'm sure. Oh, uh, try not to. No, I, you know. I came close once and that was enough. Yeah. Oh, uh, scary, man. Yes. And they would have rolled down the hill. 50 okay. degrees is about the maximum you want to. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, yeah. No They idea. say they're rated for 45, but that's a little hairier than I want to be. But yeah, I've had the meat wagon up on two wheels and it was it was interesting. The meat wagon. Is that the name <laughs> of your Land Rover? I it's, yeah, it's an, it's an ex-military ambulance. No and, kidding. Yeah, which is, you know, meat wagons, military slang for ambulance. So yeah. That's so thoughtful and sensitive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, it, I love that. It's big and boxy. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's a big um, box on wheels. And, yeah, when you're sliding backwards into, into a, a ravine, it tends to want to be up on two or less. And, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Into the abyss. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Whoa. Okay, so we're now at um, two Land Rovers. So, um, it's a good start. Dan- it's a good start. I'm, I'm working it. Um, basically, Dan was killed in Somalia. It was a terrible mistake. There was a bombing by UN forces of a house where they believed a land, um, the Land Rover, uh, a, a warlord was. <laughs> yeah. was so, weird. Those land Rover. so weird. Uh, a warlord was hiding. Unfortunately, the guy wasn't there. But the Americans bombed this place. You know, uh, tragically, and the collateral damage, which we are yeah. so blithe about was yeah. about 200 people wounded or killed. The wow. survivors ran to get the journalists. The journalists uh, accompanied the survivors under protection. But unfortunately, when they arrived at the house to try to tell the story, there, were, there was a there were about a thousand people, you know, who had gathered. And the people were so enraged that they actually killed the journalists. So it was one of those just tragic, tragic stories. There were four journalists who were killed. So a week later, I made it to Nairobi, and we wanted to make sure that Desiree was at the ceremony that it was called a celebration of life on the Ingong Hills, just the most beautiful place on earth. And so we organized for for Desiree to be, you know, fixed up so she would make it to this event. Of course, tragically, she broke down on the way, you know, because Dan was really the only one who could drive her. And she had to be literally pushed uh, to this to the celebration of life. Oh, but that's but, part of the tradition of that of particular. Course. Track, so that's not a bad thing. It was it was absolutely beautiful and funny and sweet. And in the film, she's driving on her own steam. But I think in actual fact, we were probably towing her there, too. But uh, or it was all downhill. Right. But um, when Dan was killed, I had big blue outside my house in my flat in London. And she sat there for a year until the neighbors really got cross. So we decided to take Big Blue and uh, fit her out, um, completely redo her. And we took her at that time was the the Croatian war. Mm -hmm. So we took her across country from London to to Croatia to a Croatian orphanage filled with toys and it was midwinter, and we had four people in the vehicle, including an army officer who was uh, volunteering at the orphanage. And she was, she set off, you know, and made it down to Croatia. And again, it is, this was pretty hairy stuff. And it was written up in the Evening Standard and all sorts of newspapers about this last journey of, um, and that she was donated to the orphanage. Hopefully, she did better than, um, you know, than Arabella. <laughs> but, <laughs> Yeah, but that was beautiful, actually. And then Desiree was redone and is now working at the depot, the Down Eldon Place of Tomorrow, which is a leadership center in in Kenya. So she still lives, you know, happily ever after from 1971 till now. And she's doing pretty well. Still doing important things. 
She really is. She is. But when we moved to L.A. and we, we created the Dan Elden Center for Creative Activism here in Malibu, we have this beautiful center and we decided we needed, uh, you know, we needed Desiree L.A. So we bought a Land Rover in Mexico, had her trucked across the country and then completely, you know, gutted her, redid her, her completely. And then we made a film about her, which I, I'd be d- love to post for you all to see. Please. And 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 it was great. And that was another experience where they, she had a lot of young kids in her because they were filming and she nearly rolled down the hill, you know, but they they all leaned over again and they made it back. But you guys, she, you guys seem to that, have form on this. Yeah. We, there's a little pattern. <laughs> but that was kind of her a glorious moment in the sun. And since then, she's been pretty much sitting in the parking lot of what is now Board Riders in Malibu. It's on the border of Malibu and Santa Monica. So I'm inviting you all to come and hang out with her. Uh, don't be surprised. You never know. Okay. <laughs> well, people love to climb up and have pictures sure. taken on a roof. You know, oh. that's kind of my once a year without fail. I cramp, climb up to the roof and pretend that I'm, you know, uh, okay. in charge of the world. Right. But so that's quite somewhere. fun. Yeah, yeah we, but, we call that truck surfing. Truck surfing. I love it. Well, Except that my truck Malibu. is not moving. <laughs> Well, you know, that's okay. At least it's still there and it's still it it still it did something important for a while and now it's still doing something important apparently. She's resting. She's yeah, resting, everybody yeah. who drives by sees her and I've had so many people wanting to buy her. I'm but sure. then just to, to very briefly, um, my daughter who grew up in Kenya, you know, Dan was her big brother and she learned to drive a Land Rover at about 11. Um, she was feeling that she was becoming a very boring, you know, West Side mom and she decided to invest in a Land Rover. So her family, she has an 11 year old, an eight year old and a three year old. She bought a Land Rover and she made another film, which I'd love to post for you as well yes. about her refinding her, her spark, her energy, her courage, her, you know, that which you need when you drive a Land Rover. <laughs> <laughs> we understand. <laughs> so that we, have, but then she kind of, again, she, I suppose she lost energy or courage. And so and, and by the way, that is called Arabella L.A., um, that Land Rover. And she named her daughter after the Land Rover. So Amy not only had a Land Rover named Arabella, but she has a three-year-old named Arabella named after a Land Rover, which is unusual. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's usually the other way around. The car seems to usually be named after somebody not versus the it, truck. Being, exactly. You know, being no, I think truck, it's right. hilarious, actually, because when people say, what a pretty name, you know, how did yeah. you get that? And she'll say, well, actually, she's named after a Land Rover. So just, you know, this is good stuff for you people. Um, but it, anyway, but it's, her, it's her brother's uh, Land Rover, though. So there's a nice uh, connection there. Exactly. Exactly. So basically, well, that... and, and about this time that kid, well, that kid's going to grow up to appreciate the fact that that uh, Dan had named his truck so that she didn't end up with a name like Series Three or Defender or Meat me, uh, What was it? The Meat, meat Wagon. Truck? Yeah. Meat Wagon. Yeah. I mean, there you go. Well, meat, meat Wagon would make a good middle name. A good middle name. M W. Sort of. Yeah. You could abbreviate it. <laughs> Okay. Um, And then there's a final, final addendum here. So basically, Arabella L.A. uh, was seen by a lovely man who runs the Surfrider Hotel, a beautiful Italian who was a race car driver. And he spotted Arabella resting and he asked if he could buy it. So Arabella L.A. is now the runner, as it were, the you know, the whatever, drive slowly car that picks up special VIP guests and drives them around Malibu Ooh. for the Surfrider Hotel. Nice. So isn't that cool? That is so you could, when you come and visit me, you can come and visit the Surfrider as well. All right. Um, yeah. Next time I'm in LA, I'll look you up. Please do. We'd love that. So basically, we've had a lot of Land Rovers. They've all had incredible personalities. They're all difficult, feisty, <laughs> annoying, temperamental. And absolutely wonderful. As they should be. Yes. Exactly. You wouldn't have it any other way. What do you drive? Do you, are you uh... I have a Tesla. Okay. I, I used to have ah. a Prius. I'm sorry. No. Well, <laughs> yeah. all right. No, no, you no, drive no. a Tesla. At least it's not a Prius. I mean, you know, it's, it's... Uh, cool. that's so cliched, isn't it? I, we, I love my Prius. I have a Lexus, um, older sort of a convertible thing, which is really fun. And then we've got this Tesla, second, second Tesla, actually, which it, we're model in love three. with it's like driving model mocha S. chocolate you know it's just lovely which model 
it's the it's the X or no not X. It's the one that's you know it's not the S. It's, a, it's the one that that came out Just, and then there's another one. I don't know what it's called. Well, there's the it's S. The there's the S. There's the X, which is like the SUV. Then there's a Model Three, which is the newer. It's the S. S. Yeah, I it's saw that. Oh, S. Very slow. That, yeah, that's the one that catches fire, right? Uh, yeah, they did heck, it one you know time. we just carry an extinguisher and pray. Okay. You know, I mean, if, right. listen, after a Land Rover, who's going to worry? Yeah, exactly. But, it's, yeah, what's different? Yeah, I mean, what's I, I bet the Tesla is not as fun to push. You know, honestly, it's really boring to push. It's just, well, actually, I've never had to bother. Well, of course, I think it's boring to do anything with it. It's that's boring me. to do anything uh, with it. No, the Land speed, Rover. Harold. Got speed. Uh, the, the folks gave me a lift uh, the other day in the back of, or in the front of the Land Rover, and there's just something so essentially good about it. But I am not a fan of new Land Rovers, I have to tell you. They're just so, That's okay. you know, e efficient and dependable. I mean, who needs it? <laughs> I like yeah, it. it takes the sport right out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Does anybody buy them? Oh, lots of them. Uh, lots yeah, and unfortunately, and tons and tons and tons of people are buying them. But your people, people who listen to this podcast, are buying it. Some do, some, some do. do. Yeah. yeah, there's a. I, I mean, uh, a lot of us we tend to cater towards the people who are into the vintage stuff, but uh, the new ones are still selling, and you know, people will get a new one as as a regular driver. That, you know, right. they have a, a warranty and a, and a dealer service network to support, <laughs> and then they have their their fun one that they they right. like to play with. They right. tow the other one along, yeah, mm. behind them. Is that? <laughs> yeah, that happens. That happens too. Yeah, 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 it does get, happen. You get, yeah, you get... I think that's what I would do. <laughs> yeah, but well, maybe the Tesla could tow our Land Rover up. Maybe that's what I can do now. That would oh, be good, wouldn't it? People like would notice. To, I'd like to see that. Now that I want to see. That would be. Cool. That's the thing. Yeah, we can't move it otherwise. It certainly doesn't move. I want to put it up on top of the roof of our building. That's kind of my 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 dream. Oh, that can be done. Yeah. Do you think? Oh, oh yeah. absolutely. Just remove the engine so you lose you lose some weight. Well, well I mean, the great thing about Land Rovers, they're all bolted together. So if, yeah. if you didn't have a crane, you could always take it apart and carry it up piece by piece and reassemble it. Yeah. Hilarious. That's, I, a, that's a really clever idea. But you know what? The other day we had a big party at it, Creative Visions. This is the organization that I, I founded. And this guy who is in love with Desiree and wants – he made a fountain out of his Land Rover. He has created the, the pump – generates the energy which pumps the water up and it makes this cool fountain i think you should talk to him i'm going to connect you with him is it drivable yeah sure it's totally driving drivable. it while it's fountaining would be so cool you know that's a better idea um at the moment he's set it all up and it was in front of our building the fountain worked but if you could put the fountain on the roof now you've got something there's a lot of room in the back. You could certainly do that. And that would be interesting. That'd be, I, I'm, sure. I'm curious to see what this looks like now. Yeah. He's a Land Rover aficionado and he, uh, you know, is always fixing them. And he spotted our Land Rover and just honestly fell in love. It was, a, you know, it's like an affair. Sure. Uh, awkward, really, because, you know, Desiree's spoken for, you know, it's right. one of those things that I right. had to. Yeah. But um, I would love to put you in touch with him because I think he'd be a great conversation. Absolutely. Please do. Please do. There, there we are. Do California has actually a number and the West Coast has a number of Land Rover clubs. You probably don't, aren't aware of this. And they just had the Western National Land Rover Rally, which took place, I think, in Northern California. And so well, you've got depending on how you define Northern California. But as a Southern California, pretty much everything north of Bakersfield is North California. But you got me that one. Yeah, that's so right. This, was, this is up in Bear Valley, which is you know central california in my mind but but you got to sure. the point of that is you've got a lot of land rover enthusiasts in the area don't be surprised if some of them don't come knocking on your door so. they do <laughs> now, now they do they leave me little love notes yes. so, which is which is a great asset for your business because it brings people in to see have that out front Absolutely, it does. But they don't know that we're attached to their Land Rover. I should put a sign. You're right. I, I'm not maximizing. We wanted to actually create a, a dessert company called Desiree. Uh, wait, Desiree. Desiree uh, what dessert? was it? Sweet Desiree. Sweet Desiree. And put there it out on the road because the road is PCH, Pacific Coast Highway. It's like oh, a yeah. parking lot every morning. And we could hand out donuts and stuff from Desiree. It's a good idea, huh? Yeah, mm -hmm. food in the, truck. In the UK, there's a in the UK there's at least one coffee shop that's in the back of a Land Rover. It, it's mobile, and there's also a wood fired uh, pizza oven in the back of a Land Rover. No, yeah. I love it. Mm -hmm. oh, and, no, and it in yeah. Birmingham, Alabama, there is a bar made out of a 109. Now that now you're talking. There you go. Mm -hmm. They cut it. In, they cut it in half lengthwise, and the taps come out of the side. <laughs> 
Jeepers, I'd love to see that photograph. It's probably online. Yes. Birmingham, Alabama bar, Land Rover bar. Yep. Cool. Yep. Yep. There you go. It's a Series 3 or 2. Is it 2A? I, don't I, think, it's a, I think it's a 3, but yeah, whatever. It's a Series truck. Yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love it. Oh, I'm, you're, you're, my mind is racing. <laughs> what you should do is on the side of your of, of uh, Desiree is, is put your uh, company's logo on the side of the door. And of then, course. And then distress, yeah. it, distress it so it looks like it's been there forever. Forever. Yeah, it's really distressed because we're at the beach and the whole thing is just peeling away day by day, hour by hour. You know, the, the, the metal is, is is next. The paint's long gone. Mm -hmm. The metal yeah. is next. And we call that patina. And that's, patina. It's yeah, I, I've got to send you a photograph. She's just she's really patinaed up. You know, she's good <laughs> do, enough already. Do. So, uh, so uh, Dan had so Dan had those two two Land Rovers. You now have uh, three. Have three. Oh, sorry. Three. Well, no. He had. He had two. Desiree, uh, Desiree, then he had Arabella, and then he had Big Blue. Oh, oh, sorry, but that was no. Uh, Ar Arabella does not count. She does not count. I forgive me. I'm so sorry. I, but, I've, I've blown but, it. But Arabella LA does. Anymore. But Arabella LA does count because now that's yeah, totally. So that's in yeah. there, so yes, we've got and Desiree LA. Hours. So mm -hmm. Desiree LA and Arabella LA. And what is the? Do you know what the uh, model Desiree LA is? She's seventy-one long wheelbase. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and and then Arabella was well, probably 90s. She was, yeah, she's pretty new. <laughs> Not old at all. <laughs> Actually, she, she, she could have been in the 80s. I, I can send you a photograph. Yeah, might yeah, have been a North American she, she spec was, one. She had safety seat belts. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> How weird. Fancy. How weird! <laughs> I, I, um, Harold's actually putting seatbelts in the second row of my uh, my Defender. It's an '87, and because uh, ah, they weren't sta so, they weren't standard. So so conventional. <laughs> well, I'm not so worried about the the passengers as I am, uh, you know, in the in the vehicle having to come to an abrupt stop. It's more the out, uh, the other drivers who aren't paying attention and hit the truck, and then. That's more my concern. Well, it, my concern isn't so much the passengers. It's the damage the passengers inflict upon the vehicle if they're allowed to flash about uh, unrestrained inside the truck. That too. There you go. God, those miserable passengers. Yeah. Yeah, they just become big sacks of potatoes slamming against the sides of the truck and doing damage that I have doing, to fix. I hate that about passengers. Good, yeah. good job. I'm so and glad you started it out. And we're back to the Pesky meat wagon. <laughs> Oh, annoyance, annoyance. So you're going uh, you, you're gonna to provide us then with links to all, all, all of these uh, movies and films and Absolutely. And, and, and I'd be and, honored. And I'm, I'm so delighted to be in the presence of such remarkable people who are keeping this uh, crazy legacy alive. I'm really thrilled to talk to you. That's very kind of you. And you know, we're trying. We just, uh, something we enjoy. It's a passion. Uh, we in don't get you know, I give Par I give Harold a lot of crap for it, but uh, we don't get paid. So <laughs> no, no, but just don't, don't, don't stop. People love it, and it, I'm just thrilled that you're doing this. And I know Dan would be uh, is cheering me on. I, I call him a noisy spirit. There's a beautiful book, "The Journey Is a Destination," of his work. His show uh, just opened in New York. Of his art, um, people can buy the, the the prints, including Land Rover prints. But and all the money goes back to the foundation. But in all seriousness, Desiree was probably his second greatest love after his sister. I would say he loved his sister and and, and his mother is somewhere in there, and wonderful <laughs> women. But Desiree was it. So, so tell us a little more about the foundation again. Refresh our, our memories on Thank that. Thank you. Uh, creative Visions exists to support creative activists, people who are using arts and media for social impact, storytellers who are telling stories that need to be told about problems that need to be solved. We've worked with hundreds of projects and productions in 32 countries that have touched over 100 million people. You can check us out in creativevisions.org. Um, we have a really amazing free curriculum that you can download around the Declaration of Human Rights for middle and high school kids. It's called rock-your-world.org. And it's an amazing curriculum that kids love because it's using, you know, their cell phones, it's using spoken word, hip hop, whatever they want to do, but to crusade around issues that matter to them. Cool. Fantastic. Yeah. Good Thanks. for you. Good, good for you. And it's a, it's a, it sounds like a wonderful legacy to... Uh... To, to you to Dan and 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 to and what well, to you actually 
Oh, well, thank you very much. It's, we have an incredible team of people around the world who are, you know, pushing it forward. And, and honestly, do visit the, the website because you can see the, the various films that have been created and the, the photographic projects and spoken word. What, the huge variety of projects out there, but all, uh, you know, inspired by a young man who was madly in love with a Land Rover. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, <laughs> what can I say? That's fantastic, actually. That's that's kind of the reason why the podcast existed to get these exactly. stories out and let people know about it and see the connections that are made and just all, all from what uh, two brothers uh, back in 1947 in the in the in, in a in a Welsh uh, shoreline carved into the side of the or carved into the sand. Really? Go. Yeah, that's really? that's how that happened. They were, you know, the after World War II, uh, there was a lot of uh, aluminum around, and there was aircraft paint, and the British government said we need to export, we, uh, you know, to to get the economy back and and re re you know, rebuild the country. And the Wilkes brothers uh, were with a Rover car company, and they're like, well, what should we do? And there was all these jeeps from you know World War II flying yeah. around. And they sketched out, uh, so the story goes, they sketched out the what became the, the first Land Rover, the Series 1, in the, yeah. in the, on the beach in, uh, was it, it's, is it Red Wolf Bay? I think it's Red Wolf Bay. Uh, Red Wolf Bay. Yeah. Red Wolf Bay. Sketch it inside, and there we go. Yeah, they, they picked up a stick and literally drew a line in the sand. Oh, my heavens. And, yeah. And then Land Rover has actually, uh, the, the modern car company, uh, uh, back about, uh, was it for the 65 or was it maybe, I think it was for the 65th anniversary, they took a bunch of trucks and they did the same outline in on the same bay using trucks. So it was a oh. big outline. It was pretty cool. Oh, and, man. And, and that was recreated that again for the 70th. Yes, it was. That's big. And this, the Series 1 Club now does that as an annual outing, I think. Oh, amazing. I'm going to look that up and I appreciate knowing about that. Thanks guys. Yeah. What a, what a wonderful history. Yeah, there is actually, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. There's uh, there's a family of uh, South Africans that are driving, uh, driving around the world in a, in a Land Rover. It's a 130, So that's its wheelbase. It's a long one. And uh, yeah. they're now in Europe and they're trying to head back to their home country in South Africa. They stayed at my house for two weeks. Oh, two oh, years God. Ago. Good, good job. Oh, good yeah. job. All that kind of stuff is just comes from, come from, from Land Rover. It creates well, good Well, if they community. come to LA, yeah, be sure and send them our way. Absolutely. Yes. That may be a couple of years, but I'll let yeah, they were, they were in LA a couple of years ago and actually kept ending up back there because they liked it so much. I'm sure. I'm sure. It, it reminds me a lot of Cape Town. So yeah, no, do, do reach out to them or let, let them know. Absolutely. We'll do. And one last little story to tell you about that might, might interest to you is called the first Overland. There were six gentlemen from Cambridge and Oxford back in 1959, and they got two Land Rovers and they drove from uh, the United Kingdom all the way to Singapore and back. Wow. And wow. David Attenborough was just starting out as with the BBC, gave them some film. And uh, so <laughs> there's amazing. A, yes. And, and it, there is a lot of amazing stories around the first overland. And it's something dear, near and dear to our hearts. It's and it was like the uh, probably something that'd be difficult to recreate now. You could do it, but it, it, that specific route would be difficult. But um and to the, yeah. you know, it's that, that's an amazing story. The first overland and Tim Slesser has been on the show and, uh, and he has, a, he wrote a book called first overland and, uh, it's a good read. Oh, it sounds like a wonderful read. Well, you know, in, and in, in sort of parting, I, I, I guess I'd like to share something that Dan did when he, after he had taken these 15 kids, including Christopher Nolan across Africa, he created his mission statement for what he called safari as a way of life. And it was to explore the known and unknown, distant and near, and to see with the eyes of a child all traces of horror, beauty, utopia, or hell. And he continues, uh, but you can see it in, in his book, The Journey is a Destination. But this sense of seeing with the eyes of a child, which I think you can do on the, you know, in the front of a Land Rover or any place in a Land Rover, probably better than any place else on earth. So I just uh, hope that everybody can live life as a safari as a way of life, which is really just a journey. You know, you don't know where you're going necessarily, but to make that life an, an adventurous journey. And, and the journey is the destination, of course. Can right, you? because getting there is far less important than what you do along the way. Uh, exactly. And you're probably going to break 
down so you got to enjoy the quality of the view is what he said it also in that mission statement. He said, be sure you have clean windows so when you break down, you will enjoy the quality of the view. There you go. <laughs> Good. Kathy, well, thank thanks, you very much. Thanks, guys. Appreciate Ever it. so much. Yes, I hope, Love it. hope you had a good time. We appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you very kindly. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. And that's the Center Steer Podcast for November 2018. I want to thank our guest this month, uh, Kathy Eldon, for coming on the show, talking about Dan and his uh, legacy and all his Land Rovers. Also, I want to thank the One True Packs for his continued production support, trying to make us sound better and better. And also want to thank our Patreon subscribers who help to contribute to the show so we can continue to do the show and help support the website and help support have getting shirts created so you can share that experience. Paying the bills, they are. Paying the bills, exactly. And I'm moving towards, I'd like to buy a nice, better microphone, a little pricey. I'm hoping I would sound a little better. Uh, visit our website, centersteer.com, to listen to previous shows and for show notes, which have links to stories discussed in today's show. We're part of the 4x4 Radio Network, and I invite you to check out the other 4x4-related shows at 4x4radionetwork.com. You can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and also email. You can directly support the show at patreon.com slash centersteer. Uh, if you're not a subscriber to the show, please do so, so you can get the show automatically, whether that's through Stitcher, I think I did sign up for Stitcher this past month. I finally pulled the trigger, and we're now signed up through Stitcher. So you can check that out. But, you know, Stitcher and Overcast and iTunes and all those fun applications. I think we're on TuneIn also, aren't we? Oh, yes. Thank you. And TuneIn. Yes, TuneIn. Uh, That's the one that integrates with the Alexa device, right? It might. I know I, I get tuned in through my Sonos. Because I know some, somebody or another had had the device that you could tell it, Alexa, play the Center Steer podcast, and it would. Uh, that is correct. You can do that with Google, because I, uh, I have tried uh, Google Home, and you can tell it to play the Center Steer podcast, and it will. Hey, so, Google, play the Center Steer podcast. Okay, Google. Say okay, Google. All right. Okay, Google. Ding, ding. Play the podcast. <laughs> You're supposed to say, okay, Google, play the Center Steer podcast. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I'm not getting people's device to work anyway, I'm sure. So No, actually, you, you probably could. You probably could. Uh, would you get it caught in a loop? It would be like a two-hour loop, sure. <laughs> They'd never get to the end of our show. <laughs> They'd keep the show. starting over again. They would never listen and get to hear about the free offer at the end of the show. <laughs> There's no free offer. That's how we save money. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, thanks for listening to show number 68 I hope you enjoyed it we'd love to hear from you and what you're up to in your Land Rover until next time I ask you to share the show with one other Land Rover enthusiast especially over the holidays that are coming up and you may now resume doing your important things Okay, Google, ding, ding, play the podcast.